It's our money that is shaping the future of capitalism. And we can choose, unfortunately, again, made really hard to choose, but we can exercise discretion about which pension funds we join. We can choose to join a high impact pension. We can choose to divest and pull all of our money out of fossil fuels. We can choose to, to invest in the businesses that have our, that share our values. If you look at most pension funds, like you, you would be mortified to find out what you know, most people who are auto enrolled, they're in the default pension. If you look at what it's invested in, if you, hell, if you can even find out what, you, what it's invested in, you're doing well. But then you review it and it's like, whoosh, whoosh, that's not cool. I did not want to be invested in weapons and oil and massive banks. I want to be invested in world saving biotech and renewable engineering. I want to be I'm renewable energy. I want to be invested in the stuff that's going to do a hockey stick curve in the next 10 years because that's what we need. That's Ed Doubting up next on the All Things Risk podcast. Welcome and welcome back to the All Things Risk podcast. My name is Ben Catanio. I'm your host. This is my show. This is a show all about uncertainty and risk. And I started it a couple of years ago to better understand and benefit from these things across all aspects of life and to share these insights and these conversations I have with all of you. This next one is pretty thought provoking. And I also think it's a perfect time to release this episode. Because as I'm doing this intro, which I'm recording in my flat in London, the UK is just a week and a half away from crashing out of the European Union without a deal, which would be economically quite catastrophic. If you are in the UK, regardless of whether or not you voted to leave or remain, or if you are outside this country and you're looking at all of this with some bewilderment, and regardless of what happens here over the next couple of weeks, I have a prediction. And that prediction, I think I can say fairly confidently, is this. Politics here is and will continue to be a shit show. And wherever you are in the world, I think you can say the same thing about a lot of what's going on in your country. And again, that's regardless of your political affiliation. We have divisiveness, self-interest on the part of politicians and leaders, corruption, and to be honest, political institutions that just have not kept pace with technological and societal change. And I think that's tragic because democracy is worth fighting for. So with that backdrop, let me introduce our guest to you because he's someone who's looked at these things for many years before the collective omni shambles we seem to find ourselves in around the world. His name is Ed Dowding. He's a social entrepreneur whose mission has been to look for better ways to make good things happen in the world. He's founded businesses in democracy and public decision making, as well as in sustainable food. Ed, I think, is a man before his time. But I also think that his time just might be coming. We talk about all of those things in what I think is a really great and very necessary conversation. And what I particularly liked about this conversation, as you'll hear from Ed's experiences in sustainable food and in founding what is this amazing idea for a social enterprise, this company called Represent.me, which is based on a concept called liquid democracy, which we get into. All of those experiences have brought out the constraints our society is up against in terms of overcoming the mayhem we are encountering in our politics, our governance, our economy, our society. And I think Ed is someone who really was at the coal face of all of that well before everything that we are experiencing has come to the fore and has bubbled up. And we get into all of that and lots more. We talk about things like minimalism. We spend a good chunk of time talking about food and agriculture. Obviously, we get into democracy. We talk about entrepreneurship. Ed is a very insightful person. He's extremely innovative, and we need more people like him in this world. 
So let's dive in. Here is Ed Doubting. Ed, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's, Thanks uh, for inviting me on. It's going to be fun because I tend to have two types of conversations. Mm -hmm. So one type of conversation is all about big picture risks. So the role of democracy in the world, climate change, transhumanism, AI, that sort of stuff. You know, some of the biggest risks and uncertainties of our times in society. I enjoy those ones. Yeah, yeah, so do I. I love those. And at the same time, I tend to have conversations with people who take risks in their businesses or in their lives, adventures. And mm -hmm. I think we're going to touch on both a little bit here. Okay. Yeah, so, I, imagine, I imagine we will. Yeah. yeah. So before we, we get into all that, I'd love to hear a little bit about your background and you know, who you are and what it is that, that you do. My, my background, I've, I'm one of these people who just sort of dives in to things. Uh, so my, my background, my journey is slightly uh, circuitous. Um, I, Those are the best people to talk to. <laughs> Good. I seek out people like that because you, you probably have some wonderful uh, detours that you've taken along the and way. And you that, learn an awful yeah. lot of things from a lot of different sectors. Mm. It's more like, um, you know, every now and again when I feel like, oh, God, I'm just being a dilettante and drifting around, then actually it's very useful to pollinate ideas between sectors and be that person that synthesizes mm. ideas between domains and, mm. and thinks horrible hackneyed phrase but outside the box for things and can bring fresh thinking to a, to a domain by thinking about it differently so that's that's often been my approach largely by default rather than design or choice um but i did school went to a lovely school down in dorset it was great um possibly to a certain extent wasted on me you don't really appreciate things quite as much as you when you're growing up because it's normal and then you go back there and it's wow this place is amazing mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh and went up to university in edinburgh uh, i left after my first term because it just seemed like it was going to be a bit of a waste of time essentially what did you study psychology criminology and artificial intelligence yeah, yeah. i mean i i didn't study those things <laughs> because i wasn't there but uh that's what i was supposed to be studying uh and but it it largely interestingly seemed like it was going to be a bit of a a sort of devalued experience like a, it was this process this sort of sheep dip that that vaguely intellectual people had to go through before you were allowed out in the real world and then you had this bit of paper that you could wave and it entitled you to higher salaries and things and it just seemed like the people in the room weren't actually excited about the process of learning and curious and i i i think you know, had I done a different course, had I been to a different university, you know, I know lots of people who went there, friends, you know, I, I basically lived like a student for four years, but was working. Mm. And so great experience, I would strongly recommend it. But I would also not uh, make anyone I think if you if you choose not to do it, that's probably also a good thing. Um, don't mm. be frightened of taking that decision. Um, just because it's not the norm. Mm. Um, I think you'll possibly have a much more interesting life if you don't. Yeah. Um, but, you know. What did um, you aspire to be when you were growing up? What, what types I, of things did you... Do you know what? I, haven't, I, <laughs> I either have no idea or didn't or have forgotten. Like, I'm, I don't think I did really. I, I had a certain set of values and enjoyed thinking about things and enjoyed thinking about systems and how to improve things. And my, my dad was one of these people who asked, you know, how how could you make that better and that how do you how do you build a better mousetrap um it was one of his sort of tropes mm -hmm. of and and that sort of idea of the improvability of things is i guess a perennial theme in my mm -hmm. life um the other thing i always liked geography and the sort of systemic approach mm -hmm. and the integrated approach of geography and its desire to actively look for patterns and extrapolate extrapolate um data into patterns form theories test those theories and then improve upon those theories you know so how do we get better at locating industry getting energy out of something building 
um, functional communities and, and making sure our towns are you know, healthy, sustainable, viable, um, pleasant places to live. Mm-hmm. That's you know, and geography does that, and that I, I've always enjoyed that way of thinking. So I, um, I then found myself sort of out in the world without a degree, and I'd always enjoyed making films. I used to make little like videos and things and edit them with two VHS machines, and you know, and uh, and so went off and I wanted something where I could accelerate quite quickly and you know, progress my career for what it was quite quickly and so I started making ads and um, adverts and commercial uh, commercials and um, short films feature films tv programs that sort of stuff and quickly set up a production company because as soon as you, you know you start as a runner someone realizes he can easily do that and then you become a production assistant and then you become a production manager and locations and production yeah etc and it goes and it's a really fun world to work in um but then the internet came along hmm. and people started saying oh can you put that on a cd-rom and can you make that interactive and yeah. and then can you turn that into a viral email and can you track who's viewing it and can you capture their email addresses and can you get us data about them and can you make that interact uh, oh okay this internet thing is going to be bigger mm. more exciting more how lo- long ago was this 2001 mm-hmm. 2000, sure. 2001. I mean, we, I, I had one of the first digital um, uh, sort of prosumer, I guess, digital edit suites for the films that we were making. Mm. It was that, you know, SD cards were still, mm. uh, you know, max 128 meg, that sort of thing. Things were being recorded to tape, not cards at all. So uh, it's, yeah, like mm. early days. And... Um, so it was you know, the location agnostic the being able to build things really incredibly quickly and yeah. reach a lot of people quickly it's like oh this is going to be a better place to push to try and make things happen this internet thing is going to be more exciting and then so just started saying yes to people mm-hmm. um who had internet projects and then right. knowing that you know well if it can be done I, I can probably work it out. I, I'm young and self-confident. <laughs> and and if I can't work it out, I can find other people who can and I can just charge a little bit more than they do and just sell it on and manage the project. You know, let's, let's just go and do interesting stuff. And um, and that one of my first projects was in Risk. Mm. Um, risk Analysis Project, a company called Exclusive Analysis. Oh, yeah, I know them. Yeah? yeah. Do you know Simon? No, I, okay. I've, I've never met. Uh, never he probably met exited him, but before I know you. Him. Yeah. Mm. Um, so uh, I was like second, third person working with him, mm. um, and he had this spreadsheet, and I was like, "Can you make this box go this color and conditional formatting and stuff?" I'm like, "Yeah, we could do that, Simon." Or let me tell you about this web thing, <laughs> and and sort of outlined a plan for him of how we could um, take data from you know 16,000 data sources around the world ge- uh, take headlines and geolocate those those headlines from keywords in the title and look for other keywords like gas explosion death mm. oil hospital you know whatever um and essentially do a big data exercise this is before big data was coined as a big like data little big data or pre big data pre big data mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. Or, or i guess big data existed but mm-hmm. no one really called it big data and we weren't doing data mining well we were doing data mining but we didn't call it that um and it was just like really hard and annoying maths with mm-hmm. crazy algorithms um and so we created this web platform um it's like 2003 four possibly five probably three four uh and uh that that did all this made all these beautiful colorful maps we had to build our own map servers because this was before google maps existed mm-hmm. of course um and it's so just for listeners who are trying to picture what this is all a- about so as far as i understand that that firm uh these are sort of maps based on political risk or security risk or things exactly. things like that they yeah. kind of say oh this this country in africa is bright red because of some of the politics or the civil war or whatever exactly and so it was the the client was the um insurance underwriters Mm -hmm. and they would you know someone would come to them with a risk and they would like i have no idea where that place is in colombia but 
if you want a pipeline there, I'm sure I can find a price that I'll insure it for. And then they needed to go and look in Colombia and find out why it was dangerous, who it was dangerous mm. to, because, you know, obviously an American oil pipeline has a very different risk profile from a UN-backed hospital or, you know, malaria program or something. Um, and uh, it would give them more information upon which to base their decision and thus work out what to underwrite it for. And so that was that was really cool and fun. Um, and then went off after that and did um, uh, started working for another startup uh, that wanted to do emergency communications for the police, yeah. for the Met Police, so that they could basically draw on a map and send a message to security guards within a specific area to help them in a policing task. Yeah. So, hey, this child's gone missing. Boom. Where are they? You know, keep your eyes open. Or, hey, we've got a suspect package here. It's almost lunchtime. Can you send people mm. away from here when they come out of your building? And so you you engage people that way and everything goes a lot smoother. Um, that was cool. And we, we actually launched on 7-7 um, wow. a couple of months prematurely. It, it, but we launched because basically all of the other communication systems failed. And, and so ours was the only one we had the joy that not actually that many people knew about it so it wasn't massively stress tested but it was still like huh cool there we are mm. done and but after another year and a bit of doing that it sort of realized that partly through the economics of it were really challenging mm -hmm. um and it was sort of public private partnership time and massively underfunded projects going on um, you'd be terrified if you knew some of the numbers yeah. that were involved in these sort of important things. Uh, and the um, it sort of dawned on me that we weren't really solving important problems. And you know, a, a certain amount of risk in society is healthy. Right. And we would, if we went much further, we were sort of going to start getting in the way of people who were doing their jobs really well like the you know the emergency services we were going to start getting in their way more because one way or another we were facilitating top-down interference mm. and that's not what they wanted and mm. the people on the ground wanted information but not interference and anyway so there, there's various bits of politics and sort of mm. i'm not sure that's the best way to solve the problem okay um so you're couple, you're working in a space where you, you're one of the, the sort of pioneers looking at data and what it could tell us, but the, the questions that were, that were being answered weren't really that compelling. So by this time, it had become an emergency management platform for mm -hmm. London. And th with that, you've got sort of two choices of that. Do you empower the people on the ground to mm -hmm. take better, more informed decisions and, and just give them information mm -hmm. and rely on hive mind intelligence? Right. Or do you give them command and control decisions, right. uh, command and control orders, I guess, um, which based on certain rules or uh, yeah, and based yes, based on you know, so someone in a control booth somewhere with a, to be fair, probably you know, an incredibly good oversight of the system, but they possibly don't have the same degree of insight to what's happening on the ground as the person on the ground does, and. So it, it it was, but one way or another, you know, we're t we're not talking about major incidents very often, mm. and so it, we, from my perspective, as a kind of, you know, tens of thousands of people die every day from some really basic, simple stuff that we could stop right now, mm. and if we fix that, actually, we would probably get fewer terrorists coming over and trying to do mm. stuff in the first place. So should we go and focus on those problems mm. instead? And fix those and make the world better for large numbers of people. It's slightly useful to say this error in argument, but you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't make it any less valid. Mm -hmm. And so started looking at, okay, so how do we fix the problems that we need to fix on our watch? What is our responsibility before we die? What should we improve mm -hmm. systemically, ideally, just because that's how I like to think, um, that makes a cascading and enduring difference to how things work? And it seemed that, um, that it, sorry, this is a very long background no, question. This is a, this is a, we're touching on some really good stuff that uh, we'll get into. The, um, 
I sort of basically went into a bit of an existential crisis for a while <laughs> and just read lots and got very sad about the way things are mm. in the world. Um, but looking at, w okay, so in sort of brought these problems down to the, the things that it struck me that were massively dysfunctional and going to be catastrophic if we didn't fix them were politics, political systems and how we do that. And um, we'll come on to this, I guess. Um, money how we think about it, what it is, what it represents, and can we make it actually encode value mm. as opposed to just numbers? Can we make, can we give it a moral direction and give it some sort of physical constraints such that it helps us live sustainably within one planet, that sort of stuff? Mm -hmm. um, time, how we think about work hours, you know, the 40-hour work week, and why are we doing that, and mm -hmm. what what happened to that promise of the leisure society that we chopped down all those forests and dug up yeah, all that coal reading, for? Um, John Maynard Keynes at one point mm -hmm. said we will be working 15-hour work weeks. Yeah. N it never happened. Yeah, quite. Right? And and it hasn't happened, <clears throat> not only to our detriment, but to and an ecological going up. detriment. Yeah. yeah. And the amount of time that we spend thinking about work outside of working hours, particularly in knowledge jobs, is mm -hmm. extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So that... That was a that's an undelivered promise that we should be delivering on, and our failure to tackle that one, and our failure to update the the economic model that drives and perpetuates that one as well, is just leading us to individual social and environmental mm. burnout or mm. burn up, and that's not cool. Like, and so that's we should probably fix that one, uh, and uh, and then energy was the fourth thing so money time politics and energy so the shift to renewable or nuclear you know safe nuclear um and looking at those and then so you're getting all concerned about these kinds of things and here you are doing algorithms for tactical yeah. little actually no I'm, I'm more sort of operational problems i'm i'm more i'm i'm in my sort of uh you know screw it I quit university and go and work out what to do I actually quit that job mm. and then went and had my existential breakdown oh, I <laughs> or breakdown yeah. of the, right. the systems and uh, yeah so I'm, I'm not very smart like that <laughs> doing what you said would have been much much wiser right. uh, but I sort of reached this point of frustration where mm. I was just like no I'm going mm. and <laughs> went and you just um, quit the job without a without a clearly defined next step. yeah i had no yeah. idea what i was going to do next um, mm. but uh but it's 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 that you know to a certain extent it, there's the necessity is the mother of invention mm. thing and yeah you know, i think sometimes we we live in, um, in a, a society that values comfort and because we have this level of comfort it makes it very easy to not challenge ourselves or try and solve our, you know, some of our deepest problems or society's deepest problems or, or even just have a little bit more meaning Yes, because, yeah. you know, Netflix is on and, you know, we can order, we can order food and we can order anything from Amazon. And you know, it's I, I was having a chat with a friend today who was saying that she likes, she much prefers living in basically cold rundown houses mm -hmm. where the heating doesn't work and, uh, and there's not an endless supply of hot water because it forces her to be active it forces mm. her to get out and do things and and otherwise you just yeah you become complacent and well, there's also bit. this countervailing trend of minimalism mm -hmm. particularly amongst mm -hmm. millennials and I, I was thinking about this and also talking uh, about this with uh, some of uh, my co uh, startup ease just yesterday and there is a countervailing trend towards these things because it I think it uh, uh, helps us attached to to life, to to how food is made, to uh, how uh, a little bit of struggle also gives us a little bit more uh, meaning, mm -hmm. and I think that's I think that's all I think that's yeah. wonderful and an appreciation, an appreciation of hard work and the hard yeah. work that others do as well. Mm -hmm. And what I think I like, although this is possibly anecdotal, is this sort of new minimalism seems to be there was the turn on um, tune in drop out. Yes. sort of minimalism yes. of the 70s let's yes. go off grid and, mm -hmm. and low energy and essentially low energy all around low energy in low energy out whereas it seems to be this neo-minimalism is low energy consumption maximum effect output mm. and there is a concern i think for certainly a significant number of those people to 
try and create multipliers of impact and cascade their their vision their 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 approach out into the world so it's not it's not about let's eat lentils it's about let's mm. create a regenerative polyphase agriculture that mm. creates a more abundant um food and mm. ecosystem such that we have more prosperity more food more flourishing more healthy soils more water retention etc etc mm. and so yes it's the it's that and it's the, the use of technology in a positive way as well I, yeah i don't see these a lot of these people are sort of luddites they're they're all over uh, social media using social mm-hmm. media and we can mm-hmm. get into social media perhaps in a um, in, in a moment yeah and then you know yeah. using technology you, using it within you know watering systems mm-hmm. using it to monitor crops mm-hmm. even to harvest and mm-hmm. and you know check on crops that that sort of thing yeah it's fantastic um so i suppose it just comes from a consciousness of the f- one's own footprint mm-hmm. and that idea of treading lightly uh, on the world and that's that's nice and realizing that actually you don't have to sacrifice that much mm. in order to accomplish that and through that sacrifice comes greater gains um, both for yourself and for others so yeah um so yeah so in, interestingly um sort of segueing into mm-hmm. agriculture as we did then i it yeah. it sort of dawned on me that with this politics money time and energy uh, sort of quadrant of challenges um that food and agriculture was one that was implicitly interwoven into all of these things so um food is our largest use of fresh water it's our biggest cause of premature death it's the world's largest employer you know if you include self-employed um sus- um i've forgotten the term you know self-sufficient farmers um and um, subsistence subsistence yeah, farming yeah. thank you um uh and so this and plus also it's a it's a culture that in theory self-defines as being very adaptive and responsive Mm. and so in theory again quickly uh, adopts new techniques and practices and so if you can get you know a whole bunch of farmers to to change how they plow a field Mm -hmm. you can totally change the ecology of that microclimate and if you can multiply that, you change the ecology of a region or a state or a mm. country. And the ability to do things like draw down carbon into the soils, because carbon and soils are fantastic for storing carbon. So and if you, uh, on the financial side and the employment side, if you relocalize supply chains and, and help people source more locally, it firstly, it, it does that so you get something called the local economic multiplier so the velocity of money in the local area um, goes increases so more people spend more money locally and therefore more people are employed and more people Mm. can live in our rural areas and i think Mm. counter urbanization is a desirable thing because the risk in cities back to the risk thing Mm -hmm. you know cities are massively vulnerable Mm -hmm. and that's possibly going to be a bad thing for humanity and by increasing decreasing the inequality between cities and the countryside cities are massively vulnerable and but but also you the the i i don't know what all of the i don't know the statistics are but if you look at the yellow jacket the gilet mm-hmm. jaune movement in france and a lot of those uh people are are not from the major urban centers but they they feel neglected yeah. they're from i guess the you know, sort of middle France, or I, I'm not what you, I'm not sure what you would call that, but um, communities that are not served by public transport, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and they see, you know, the the current government as not not really caring about yeah. about their 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 sort of situation. So the inequality and the divisiveness, and and goes of course up. not just France, UK as well. Yeah, like, you know, we've we've totally US, screwed yeah. over our regions. Mm. Yeah, and, and you know our our countryside, and to no benefit whatsoever and you know, we, there are lots of people who are, i believe very rightfully angry about this level of neglect because it doesn't take much to make these areas flourish yeah. and and we're denying them even that and through the, sort of some very strange ideas about resource allocation and yeah. so 
So if you can help those communities help themselves, relocalize supply chains, improve attention being paid to the food and food agriculture system, you improve practices. You know, it, If it's local, it's more likely, if you've already started paying attention, you're more likely to go organic or at least free range or one way or another start paying more attention to the standards because you want to write it up proudly on your pub blackboard and also find a way of charging two or three pounds more for it right and if it's like jack from over the hill provided us with that lamb that you're eating right now yeah. it's a nice story that people like um and so so I, I basically set up a business in uh trying to map the supply chain between various different businesses to um introduce more transparency and create a sort of to a certain extent an online marketplace but certainly an online search engine that showed who's got what where and who wants what where um product wise and so you could then say you know where did you source these from and or print out a little map that goes in the back of your menu and it's got all of your suppliers and then little personal stories dotted out on it and shows what produce you get from which place and um, similarly, if you're start, you know, if you want to find apples for your village shop locally, you can just type in apples in your postcode, boom, and that's where you can get them from. Uh, and it's got these sort of cascading benefits where you can then start to have new entrants come in and optimize the supply chains because who's delivering what where is visible. So if you've got like parallel journeys, you can mm-hmm. approach those people, those stakeholders, and say, yeah, let me do this for you. I'll do it half the price, etc. So. Um, or create more collaboration, more opportunities. And it's just that if we put lots of open data out there, mm. make it really easy to use, let's see what happens. Mm. Um, and so that was that was fun. Did that for a couple of years, but really hard, really, <laughs> really hard to get. Well, I was going to say, it's it, you, num- number one, I suppose you need people, consumers that are interested in knowing this stuff. And yeah, that's tough because you can just... You can just go uh, on online and get um, you know get your apples from Sainsbury's mm-hmm. or whatever and get them delivered and they maybe come from South Africa or yeah. what, something like that um, and they're really cheap um, or the, you, whatever your chickens are you know two pounds for a, a, a chicken you know whatever yeah. all of all of this it's just the convenience culture once again that, that quite, you're fighting against it quite spot on and very few people have an incentive to fix the problem. Well, in fact, there's a disincentive because exactly. uh, you know, incomes are under strain, and so it's just a lot easier yeah. to feed yes. your family with uh, you know, with stuff that's sourced um, from God knows where, produced however, yes. however maybe. I would actually just sort of point of information. Yes, it is if you're time pressured, mm-hmm. but if you're not, it's actually easier mm-hmm. and cheaper to you know buy in bulk buy, buy sure. from the right local shops and get your get your deals um you know hell even if you don't do sustainable sourcing just being able to buy it take the time to find somewhere where you can buy a sack of potatoes mm-hmm. will massively cut your costs mm-hmm. yeah and so on and so on so i'm it's hard it's a lot harder than doing what the industry what the market wants you to do mm-hmm. because that's how the market makes most money but it's not impossible um, and the other thing that became increasingly evident was that the food system is based enti- almost entirely on externalities. So costs that aren't born within the cost of production of the food. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so firstly, massive subsidies at one end and massive um, health implications and pesticide implications, mm-hmm. antibiotic overuse, uh, things that... I, I find it amazing the amount of antibiotics that that, that are used in, mm. you know, in meat and, mm-hmm. you know, in we consume that. Yeah. And the risk that poses, uh, you know, it's, it's up there. It's in my top two. One of the things I've said a few times now on the show is that antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest risks that that exists in our world and that very few people are talking about. Yes. And it's also spectacularly hard to do anything about. Mm. It's not a quick fix solution thing. It's mm. not, you know, we, we get better at mitigating it and isolating, but and you're right. There's a, there's a, a negative externality there because if that risk was kind of costed into the product, mm-hmm. then it wouldn't be mar- The market wouldn't be viable for it, but it isn't. So, it, or, Everyone needs to include it at once. Yeah. 
such okay. that and and possibly phase it in over time so they don't get massive consumer backlash and everyone you know goes back in riots because they're spending 90 percent of their income mm. on food but you need to raise the bar for everybody at mm. once because one way or another that's a non-sustainable food system mm. so you know, reality is going to crash that one day mm. and that's you know, we we yeah. need to fix that and there's also this thing about monoculture mm -hmm. uh, you know agribusiness sort of monoculture crops being used for one or soil being used for one crop depleting yeah. nutrients and soils and mm -hmm. uh, and we're losing a lot of the the topsoil and all of all of this sort of thing and there's a there's a parallel with other things in culture you know the the monoculture there's you know everybody dressing this the same or wanting the same sorts of sorts of things uh, and same life trajectories and and actually we need to kind of shake all of that up and, and actually embrace the differences in yes in in all kinds of yeah aspects of life yes we we've repeated these patterns of sort of uh, it's all about economies of scale so yes you know. quite we're we're prematurely optimizing for the wrong kpis we we we've put we, because we've got numbers and because we put money on these things and so and because it's really hard to internalize the externalities just even in a, in a number way like even how would you do it what numbers would you track how would you make it so that the benefit of tracking them is worth the cost of tracking mm -hmm. them it was traditionally or historically hard it's getting easier and easier and tech essentially helps us solve some of that and there's interesting opportunities for cryptocurrencies to come in mm -hmm. and start broadening out um the the possibilities for fixing that but um yeah it's it's a big problem and so uh, so then realized so okay hmm, this isn't going to fix the problem as i wanted it to do uh i think i probably left that business too early i should have tried more things and run more I was experiments say now the uh, just as we we're talking about there's a countervailing trend and i i think with particularly with the millennial generation uh, yes and no okay uh, exactly the same phenomena still exist mm -hmm. of you know like convenience there are more people so um farm drop which is a fantastic if you're in london sign up to farm drop uh, it's a fantastic business that aggregates supplies from local um, brilliant and you know, high welfare high responsible um, farms producers mm -hmm. and then boxes it up and distributes it um, you know like hello fresh and and these other ones um but it's all brilliantly locally sourced and so ben who started that started at the same time as i did food trade and you know talking with him over the years it's yeah it's really hard and you know the the pressure on his business and what he has to do to compete you know so from that regard i'm really glad i left <laughs> but but i'm i'm sort of slightly annoyed i didn't run more experiments and find a different customer need to solve mm -hmm. um but you know, live and learn. Mm -hmm. But I then went off and uh, started a, a democracy business. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. What led yeah. to that? Uh, so actually about the same, same time during that sort of uh, existential review of the world, and uh, someone told me, a really good friend uh, called Joseph Davies Coates, um, uh, who is the most brilliantly, broadly knowledgeable man and... Uh, just full of so many good ideas of how to improve things. He told me about this system called liquid democracy. Uh, and so liquid democracy is essentially you get to choose your own representative or your, uh, your own, your own representative for different topics. So by default at the moment, we have our MP or our Senator or whoever who takes decisions for us. And once every five years, we pick between one of three or four colors that are available to us and they decide everything for us. Mm. And that's okay as a default, but, you know, actually, and good job, well done, I really admire the work you're doing. But in health, God, you suck, MP. Mm. I, I do not agree with you in health at all. And I don't understand why, what is so different about my vision that makes it not integrate with your worldview. But one way or another, you want to privatize the shit out of everything, and I want to keep it, mm. uh, you know, essentially public um, and high-performing in public. I don't see why that's a problem. And... 
but you might so, agree with a guy on economic policy or foreign policy yeah, or everything that, else yeah, yeah. fine mm-hmm. that's you know take care of that you're doing a you know at least a good enough job on it and i don't care enough about those other things because they're not quite as essential so on health i want to pick a different representative mm-hmm. just on things tagged health as they come through the system done oh actually maybe education as well okay i'm gonna give education mm-hmm. to someone else and so you start distributing power between the people that you trust to make better decisions than the incumbent. It's not to displace the incumbent because obviously we still have a parliamentary system and they're still in charge, but it's to help a society better surface the intelligence from within the crowd Mm. and better um, allocate trust to where it is, as the crowd determines, can be most usefully deployed. Mm. And so actually it's, really like democracy but it's just what we would do with democracy if we invented it now Mm. so you can have your default you can be as engaged as you like and you can have multiple representatives for different things we didn't do it because the paperwork would have been a nightmare but now you can do it really easily Mm -hmm. and so cool that seems like a fun idea and so but i couldn't work out a business model for it Mm. and so i left it i parked it Mm. um as a as an aside i mean it's so interesting because our democratic institutions are Actually, they're they're kind of ancient, mm. and if you think about the the U.S. electoral college system, for example, the reason why that exists is because people couldn't get to the same place to vote, so you'd have to get someone on a horse to go and give all the votes to this one one place, who would then submit them for the the presidency. It's, yeah, and, and it's this is like three hundred years old, three hundred plus years old. Yeah, and it's a it's a really good argument for you know. To, uh, to point to for the merits of competition because it's it's the one domain in which there isn't a competition mm. there's competition within it as you have parties competing mm. but they're both playing exactly the same game within the same system and it's not allowed to evolve and of course over time it gets increasingly corrupted in quotes and you know whether that's active or passive corruption and just laziness and complacency well, we it, don't need to evolve, therefore about, why evolve absolutely what you're talking about is harder to corrupt i think because there are too many nodes whereas if you have one representative then you can kind of then you can then you can uh as a whether, whether it's a lobbyist or or, yes. or whatever yeah. then you can kind of link policies and do all this sort of horse trading over well i'll vote for you on this if you you know i i put a flag in that point and and sort of it's there are ways to game any system mm. uh so and it's possibly it's possibly just harder to track the corruption that would happen under a liquid democracy system probably doesn't mean that we wouldn't try and corrupt it anyway mm-hmm. like there are there are bad so, actors all over the place but one way or another yeah. there's greater transparency and greater potential to fix the problem when it becomes discovered and emerged and when we fix it it's not catastrophic mm-hmm. that it's oh look there was one bad actor out of 12 different people making a decision for people in health we replaced them everything carried on fine rather than Oh, we had a, so what would know. that look like in practice? You'd have a representative or representatives for health and <clears throat> others for education and infrastructure. And is that- so if we apply it to, you know, say a normal government model, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you you would be – so you, you could go on there. You could run – essentially you could create a sort of simplified House of Commons. Mm-hmm. Here is a bill going through Parliament. This is what your MP, or this is, these are the fundamental questions, you know, delivered in plain English, nice and accessible. These are the fundamental questions going on this bill. What do you think about them? If you want to say what you think about them, you can vote and you can participate and you can find out yeah. how you compare with everybody else. If you don't, that's okay. Your MP is taking care of it. That's your default. Over time, as you answer more and more of these questions, you then go, oh, actually, on health, we do disagree. You know, we're in the red zone on our agreement. And but I can see with this person, I'm in the green zone. So I, I then there's, there's an interesting little nuance here that's quite fun to talk about um, that you don't actually delegate your vote to anybody. So you don't put pressure on anybody. Like if you suddenly found that you had 200,000 votes for geopol- geopolitical issues, like shit, like you might have the deciding vote on whether we do or do not go and bomb whichever country we're bombing today. But what happens is that you copy that person's vote by default instead. 
So you, it's still your vote. You still have responsibility for it, but you're just taking their advice. So if we had a conversation in the pub and you said, I think we should do this, I would go home and vote that way anyway. Mm. It's just a way of automating that process. Mm. Right? Um, so, But it takes the pressure off everybody and also makes it less vulnerable to corruption mm -hmm. uh, because that person never actually has your vote in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the... Um, so then what that then looks like is that you, essentially rather than having you know 35 million people going up to 600 representatives in your in your structural organogram you have 35 million people going to a couple of hundred thousand people who then in turn probably delegate off their vote to people that I they see. trust who know better I and see. so then you've got a yeah. thousand people and and so within each topic within each domain so but it's really like to draw it out and to, and really to map complex, it, it's but, really complex. But, we've got but actually, data in the systems to be able to do, to do that. Yeah, and conceptually, it's simple. Mm -hmm. It's just that map it, and it gets really complicated. So, yeah, it's a it's a really powerful idea that, again, in theory, should um, so would help everybody to, make better decisions. So, would people have to vote for all these representatives at a certain point? So. I think there are different ways that you could transition it. The way that I would advocate is that essentially we give it, we give that system. Let's start with zero executive power for 10 years at least, because, you know, we're a baby with a gun. Like we suddenly had learned what power is like and, and right. humans being humans, we won't be used to it and we will probably screw something up. But let's after a couple of years, Mm -hmm. introduce um, you know, common executive power on, on a couple of really okay. essentially unimportant decisions that don't matter too much if we screw them up and also let's put sunset clauses on them so they automatically expire after 10 years or something like that so you know let's just be safe and keep the stabilizers mm -hmm. on the system um, but if um, if you make it so that if, if I were an MP MPs are just normal people who get in, get elected, right? They don't know anything about health. They don't know anything about education. They may know an awful lot about, you know, mm. supply chains and businesses and manufacturing, but no idea. Mm. If I had a system that said, "Hey, here are the twelve people who know who, you know, have credibility within the system and have the trust of eighty percent of the constituents within your um, within your constituency." and represent the views of 98% of the constituents within your constituency. If I could get those 12 people into a room and help me make a decision, mm. that's great. Mm -hmm. And so it's a bit, we're better harnessing this, this latent knowledge, this and passion and intelligence and, and mm -hmm. experience that lies dormant within the system mm -hmm. and bring it in to help you as an MP make a better decision. So as an MP, I should be flying if I use this. But getting them to start using it, another story entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, they're, it's right. that's a, that's a hard sell right. um, for all sorts of incredibly good reasons. Mm -hmm. I might add. I mean, I, you know, they are doing an inc insanely hard job with some very odd pressures on them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, I can see why it's why you know I don't I don't. It annoys me no end that they don't adopt it more readily. But um, but I can I have every sympathy with why they don't mm -hmm. so can you tell us a little bit about what ha happened what was your experience with that that business you said it ran so into some so uh so i, I, st I started represent mm -hmm. so represent mm -hmm. actually this this whole liquid democracy thing is it's um uh, a very minor feature of represent i see okay. um but it's it's a it's a really nice goal and driving you know world vision um but the basically it's it's re it's like an open version of YouGov or an open polling system so anyone can ask a question anyone can answer a question and then it just does lots of analysis on and you make it really easy for people to answer those questions so we were pushing questions out to chatbots and like Facebook Messenger and things and so you like a question would just pop up on Facebook Messenger like, you know do you think voting age should be lowered 16 mm, yeah okay mm -hmm. and then as soon as you answer it and it's just as easy to answer it as it is to dismiss it mm. so people just yeah answer it they see how other people have answered it oh that's quite interesting cool and then tomorrow another one comes in and answer yeah. that one and when you think that within your lifetime you have 14 votes in a general election 
you know, just 14 opportunities to vote mm. before you die. That's how long you live as an adult. I mean, you know, current politics, we may have like, 30. Have it, <laughs> but, 20 years. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but uh, you know, fingers crossed. Um, you do that vote in two weeks mm. on represent. So the amount of information about who wants what, where, and what they're prepared to do about it, and how consistent they are on that view as well, mm. because you are you have this ability, and people engage so much and want to engage because we want the world to be a good place. We want to share and make these things happen. Um, you know, we are good people struggling against annoying systems, mm. and it, it, it by. Um, by getting that information out, you end up with a much this massive wealth of publicly owned, commonly created resource with which you can drive much better decisions. Mm. So by way of comparison, you've got the census that happens every 10 years, costs a fortune, you know, a couple mm. of hundred million each time, and um, at least actually, and... Um, generates decisions uh, generates information upon which huge infrastructural projects are based now and allocation to, of resources and so i'll, I'll yeah, just finish this it, thought um and it's as as you know the world is getting faster once every 10 years isn't enough for a census and so our information is a deeply crude hmm. because there are only 50 questions deeply out of date and just not keeping pace with contemporary society. And so if you can increase the density and richness of that information, you can go, hey, we've got 700 people in Lewisham who want to join an electric car sharing club, but hey, local authority, there aren't any car sharing, um, there aren't any parking bays, there aren't any charging points. And you know, your area, your um, borough, which you have responsibility for air pollution for, yeah. like you've got 700 people there wanting to sell their cars and s help you solve that pollution problem. This is where they live. This is the streets you should put it on. We just save you a ton of research. And then you can take that and you can go to Zipcar and you can say, hey, Zipcar, we've got 700 new customers for you. Give them, you know, 100 quid off each and boom, there's your business model for a, a massively engaged civic. Um, again, the reality is harder. I was going to just actually ask about, so the the whole campaign and you know, process around elections. On the one hand, I can understand the the appeal of what you've described. Wouldn't you have others that say, for example, in electoral commissions, well, you know, to have a campaign, you need to have like a set number of weeks and you need to have, you know, sides that register and, you know, pros and cons and, you know, public debates and, and, and then let the people decide based on the information. You can't just put, you know, surveys online and get, get good data. I, I'm, I'm not sure I have any respect for whatever the for electoral commission yeah. <laughs> thinks at the moment. Yeah. Uh, bearing in mind they're the ones who allowed a very, very simple, yeah. incredibly poorly run, mm. arguably should be illegal uh, mm. referendum mm. to have happened with a you know this binary choice that there is no intelligent way of answering mm. because no matter what you did whether you voted yet yeah, remain whether you voted yeah. leave or whether you didn't vote all of those were really stupid answers and so mm. yeah, by, well, they were also all really good answers but they were so yeah, no well, the electoral commission sure. like, I'm, sure. so, yeah. I'm not and, sure and I care when, they're not really doing their job yeah. plus instantly yeah. we have to register to vote Yes. The Americans had a revolution based on this one point. No taxation without representation. Why Why do I have to register to vote? Yeah. I, why are you making it hard your for me to vote? Your registration should be automatic with your tax return. Quite. Right? Get a USB stick, Electoral Commission, run down to the HMRC, get the, get the data, and stick it back on and, and make, like, pre-validate everybody. Like, mm. This is not a problem. You, and they're failing in their job. Mm. And they spend millions every year pretending, trying to solve this problem and giving grants away like, to people like By the Ballot and these other people who do these amazing campaigns, getting young people out there voting. But it's, it's, it's the wrong problem. Yeah. They're, they're neglecting their responsibility and they, aren't, they, aren't, they haven't modernized. They mm. haven't kept pace with essentially user problems. So, yeah. So, yes, they may think that, but A, they'd be wrong and I don't respect them. And B, um, they're, they're also wrong in as much as the opinion, you know, opinions are being formed every day. Giving that opinion, I'm not, nothing that we were doing was executive. 
we weren't saying you know vote here and and this will happen vote here and we will bring back hanging if enough of you say it mm. no we're not going to do that mm. what we want to know is how many people would if we mm. did and let's also test it and mm. let's ask 10 questions about bringing back hanging or about justice in in our society and what do we actually want like we have this visceral reaction like yeah we need stronger punishment but why and to what ends? And so we can better triangulate where people are at and help people understand for themselves where they're at by by asking questions. It's this sort of dialectic of, mm. of surfacing better information by layering on questions. And so we come to a better understanding of what we're actually getting at. And then you can start to think about what solutions you might apply to that. So if you can identify, oh, there is a visceral desire to... Mm. You know, this sense of we have this sense of injustice. Where is that because we just don't know how the justice system works? Mm. Is that because um, crime is overreported and so on and so on? Well, so. if you look at what's happened here with Brexit, arguably this the last uh, two years, two and a half years, have been an education process in how the EU and international trade barriers work and all of this sort of stuff that people didn't understand at all when they voted or didn't vote. Mm -hmm. Argu yeah, you know, arguably they they stayed away particularly young people because mm -hmm. young people don't vote as much and maybe this is part of the part of the problem yeah and and i think the slightly malicious and annoying thing is that actually it's it's also by design and i don't mean to be sort of conspiratorial about it but essentially if you if you have if you can pay tax by default and and are auto enrolled on that and you aren't auto enrolled on voting registration like that that in itself is enough to go yeah you're not actually trying plus then you know, none of the main parties in the uk are are in favor of proportional representation mm -hmm. and so so you you're saying that you don't think my vote should count great okay fine you know they are not just on mm -hmm. that those two principles i can see how you might think that increases mm -hmm. stability but the signal that it sends to to your population Mm. that's not cool guys that's really not cool especially when you know essentially a lot more of us are a lot more educated than a lot of you <laughs> and have spent more time working in these areas that we care passionately about mm. so it's it's not only neglecting to use and make use of a very good resource it's also belittling that resource mm. so yeah i'm I, so and that is why i started mm. represent because mm -hmm we can do better than this and we deserve better than this and if we don't do better than this guess what we're going to trend towards authoritarian well, we are binaries yeah. yeah exactly and um and so yeah i'm sorry i didn't start it sooner no no it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's fascinating because on the one hand people say well democracy is in retreat and authoritarianism is on the rise well mm. what you're saying is yeah and we're we're the ones causing democracy to retreat because we we haven't kept pace with how society works who's the we in that sentence our societies our our, our governments mm. yes the people who represent us yeah yeah or don't as yeah. the case happens. and and i suppose to a certain extent we've allowed it to happen but if you look at the feasible choices that we have no one is offering a better solution so we simply do not have the mechanism to vote for the solution that we want and so therefore you know if if the if the choices are being curated for us if neither of the main parties are going to suggest a better solution because it's in their interest not to then it's up to the citizens to mm. pause and to you know say hang on a second government you know let's let's go back to magna carta sort mm. of and you know and it happens every 400 years or so we have to basically just kick the machinery of government and go okay you've gone too far off the rails now let's pick it back up set it back on the rails and maybe tweak its direction and, and change a few things so that doesn't happen um, and and just restore it. But sure. that is an incredibly bold <laughs> move that we don't really know how to do nor have the means for in, in contemporary society. Uh, it's, yeah. If anything, we, we were less and less happy with, we, we want it's very uncomfortable as we just talked about it's very disruptive mm. but we're being disrupted anyway yeah 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 the, i mean there's the, leaving the status quo is infinitely more disruptive than actually pausing and dealing with the issue mm -hmm. um but unfortunately what it looks like when we try and sort of deal with the issue is gilets jaunes mm -hmm. and 
you know, get it, but it's not massively constructive. And so, you know, we need better ways of doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, That's there's, yeah. So there's a lot. I'd lo- there's a. I really want a party to stand mm. to to come up and, and say we are going to stand for one election during that one election we are going to fix these mm. low hanging fruit and easy loopholes that everyone can agree on in democracy we're going to make it so that you can't lie in a referendum mm-hmm. we're going to make it so that every referendum has you know threshold points and at least three three options on it we're going to possibly make it so that every referendum has you know it has to be phased over time so we have education periods and vote and choice periods and then voting periods and sunset periods um, we are going to make it so that we bring in proportional representation and default re- voter registration. And then after you know, whatever the minimal time is, we can get that done in. We are going to disband. And then you can go back to having your conservatives and your Labours and your Lib Dems and whoever's and your SMPs and your Greens. Like, crack on. Because we just need to improve this system for everyone. We've got giant loopholes which are screwing over everybody, mm-hmm. regardless of where you are on the political spectrum. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think that would be a good, a good party. Yeah, it would be, and mm. I think the the US needs this mm-hmm. desperately. Yeah, uh, that that system feels totally broken, mm. uh, and and then you've got you know the likes of Putin and others taking pot shots at you know well look at look at what's happening in the US you know opioid crisis or, or mm-hmm. whatever uh, their, their democracy doesn't work. Mm. Look at what's happening in Europe. Look at what's happening in in Britain. Democracy doesn't work, guys. And to a certain extent, it is just a function of or, um, there are countries with proportional representation also suffer similar problems but propor- the first past the post voting system definitely exacerbates these problems and there are you know only a handful of countries that still have it it's so dysfunctional and yeah. um, there's a very good organization called make votes matter um which is um a pr campaign organization proportional representation campaign organization and they've been doing some great work on pushing this uh, and yeah check them out and they've also got some really nice videos on um just that highlight and demonstrate the maths of why first past the post goes wrong over mm-hmm. time yeah, Canada has the same mm. the same system mm. as well. Um, and same similar similar debates, but less uh, less explosive than <laughs> yeah. Yeah. than than here. Uh, I, I did want to talk a little bit more about represent. Yes, and, and what um, what it, what it's there or what's meant to to achieve. What your experience has been with it, and what you've learned. So it's it's been it's been fantastic and I've learned a lot um, arguably not enough or soon enough but uh, you know that's life uh, the we had really high engagement um, you know people want to participate and just um, for what 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 was it how, how would you explain it to somebody who what was represent yes, or what is it or, uh, is it uh, what, is it an is or is so, it a was so uh, uh, it represent is is still online at represent.me yes. mm-hmm. it's um, the the servers are running it's mm, mm-hmm. it's 99% functional um, mm-hmm. don't try and log in with Facebook they change the rules and mm-hmm. um, which is good uh, and but I'm not pushing it at the moment because I'm trying to pivot the business model mm-hmm. behind it and come up with a both a better business model and a better business structure uh, that reflects that um, so it's there your data won't be lost and but you know essentially I needed to pay bills and our plan A wasn't working and so I'm not one of these people who can look someone in the eye and go hello can i have lots of money please (laughs) i don't know what i'm going to do with it but i'm going to sort of experiment and i like having the answer and knowing that Mm. even though i may be massively wrong at least i know what i'm going to do and Mm. why i think it's going to work rather than i screwed up and i'm in a bit of a hole at the moment can i have some money to keep this going it's not you know so uh so it's a um, it's a it's a civic centric uh, voting platform that uh, that increases public participation in decisions. Uh, it has and it works at any scale uh, and for any size of organisation. So you can have groups in there and private groups, and so you can you know if you're my my netball team can vote on you know something or other. My netball union facilities and yeah, yeah, my union can vote on mm-hmm. something or. Um, one of the opportunities that we're exploring at the moment is in uh, pensions and and occupational pensions and so members of this pension scheme can vote on something and 
it's all of the data is open it's obviously anonymized and so you know identity is protected and we were first on the gdpr thing like it's it's definitely we are pro civic we are pro user rights um and but we are also pro maximizing the effect of the information that you put into it so that when you vote we do our best to make sure that your mp your local authority mm. or, your, or your group leader or whoever sees that information and and has the yeah, essentially everything that they need to mm. understand who is participating where they're participating whether it's representative and and mine into the data but as as so can anybody anybody can interrogate it um and we've got yeah apis so you can build stuff off the back of it as well there's someone doing something actually with brexit at the moment um building various sort of campaign style tools and informational tools on it so uh that so it's 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 there and it's working but the the what i was hoping was that um mps and political parties would essentially see the innate genius in the system go and embrace it and then give us some money for it uh and if they didn't parliament would and if they didn't local authorities would and Local authorities, I think, would have done, but, you know, essentially local authorities are under stress mm. and and they don't really want... I sound so cynical, but it's sort of through proof that they don't really massively want public participation in decisions because then it slows them down and makes them more expensive and they're just trying to get that school built and the longer we wait, the longer we don't have a school and the harder it gets and the more expensive yeah. it gets. And, ah. yeah. mm. So none of the clients that I wanted to have as clients wanted to be clients, which is like such a stupid error. <laughs> but but uh, that's, you know, but what I wanted to make sure of was that our values kept on being met, that we were a civic centric for the people, a political tool that was strong on open data. We could get parties interested in adopting it if they could close the data. If they and they alone had view of the data. Yeah, of course. Yeah. No, <laughs> that's not the point. Yeah, that's not how democracy works. Their, their incentives are almost at odds with what you're trying to do. Unfortunately, well, their short-term incentives are, yes. their long-term incentives aren't. But yes. getting people, getting politicians to think in terms of the long-term mm. is hard. Mm. So. Mm. so what's the pivot? I'm not going to tell you. Okay. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's kind of exciting. Um uh, in that regard, maybe I should tell you, um, but there's I haven't locked it down yet, and so and I want to. But essentially, I would have thought that somebody who wants to be a disruptor would be very interested in this. Uh, yes, the, the I don't know the Elon Musk of democracy or some or something. Yes, interestingly, whoever that is. So, a lot of people are. There are a lot of people who are excited about funding projects in democracy, but they tend to want to fund partisan projects in democracy. They don't want to improve the game. They want to improve mm. their outcome. Mm. And their outcome may be the benignest outcome in the world, right? And they, but nonetheless, mm. there is that it's, they, they want campaign tech, not mm. democracy tech. Mm. And help me win, not help, imp- help the other guy win, potentially. And so that's, that's a challenge. But... And so it's how do you keep it civic centric? Um, and you most need to get all of the major participants or people from different sides to kind of agree to, to to fund, but that's hard. Well, yeah. So what we're doing is is making it so that there's a lot more in it for the individual uh, citizen, the mm-hmm. individual, uh, so that uh, we're essentially gamifying it more and applying a bit more of a lottery model okay. to it so that it's more fun and rewarding to participate in. Mm. Um, but that also uh, multiplies up the impact in a really clever way. Mm. And so, yeah, there, there's there's definitely a good idea in there, but mm. having been having thought I've had good ideas before, I'm being wary and testing this one quite thoroughly before before essentially committing myself to another three years of pushing a very heavy rock up a very steep hill mm-hmm. yeah well that makes that, that that sounds pretty pretty sensible yeah um, the other thought i had is people uh, who invest in these kinds of things sometimes you know i think i think they invest in people rather than just the tool or the the idea so this yeah. is a great lesson 
actually. I think I think I I, I didn't really appreciate that mm. going in. And that the people who invest in them are ready to you know, they they understand what a risk it is. Yeah. And they're very compassionate and generous with that with that with that understanding mm. if you know how to use it. And I never really realized it. And so I, I, I essentially felt a lot of shame for failure in the last few years. And oh, I, I, the sh- you, you shouldn't because <laughs> you're, you're trying to <laughs> revolutionize. You know, it's like, I, oh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't change the I'm system. I'm sorry, I didn't save the world. didn't save the world. So yeah. I feel so, yeah, so, so I mean, yeah. it's, it, it's, it's easy to... Yeah, I was trying yourself. to get a better yeah, Brexit, right. but I couldn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, single-handedly, yes. And yes, but but nonetheless, you know that mm. when you're close to something and you, it's it's your project, and, and you know, I think these are really these are the hard things with with sort of passion projects. And we were talking before we went on air uh, about um, you know some some types of small businesses that are just the uh, luxury dog food or or, or whatever that's mm. a product, and the point is to make as much money as possible. And if it doesn't, then I'll pivot to something that makes more money. But when we're attached to the project, it's it's harder to let go of the ideas, mm. and it's it's also harder to see the genuine pivot, problems yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's massively frustrating, but it does seem to be a, a real case that we have, as individuals, we have identified problems and unidentified problems, and we'll pay to solve the the identified mm-hmm. problems if we know we've got a problem. We will, you know one way or another pay money to make it go away or do something to make it go away but if there's something that society needs that is a commons problem Mm. that is shared by everybody and it's not our own individual responsibility to fix it we know it's there we know you know it's annoying but it's not really my problem Mm. and so there's ultimately end of the day there's just not a business model in it Mm. there might be a philanthropic model in it there might be other tangential business models Mm. in it you get them engaged you make money off something else and you cross subsidize but there's not a direct hey world do you want a better democracy yeah well we're going to have to fund it model in there because not enough Mm. people want to do that you know you look at wikipedia possibly humanity's finest accomplishment (laughs) right i mean it's amazing the amount of information the amount of knowledge that's been aggregated into that and they struggle for funding that's wrong (laughs) like that's just i i it just bewilders me every time I mentioned this, and it, but nonetheless, that's the reality, and we've got to play the cards we've been dealt, and that's what we've got to deal with as as entrepreneurs, as people trying to change the system. It's all with the consent of everybody else, and you can only do things if you've got people willing to back it with their mm. attention and their time. And if you can't do that uh, with their attention, their time, and their and their, their attention and their money, basically, mm-hmm. and if you can't do that, you, you haven't got to business and it annoys me because so many of the problems that we need to solve in this 21st century Mm. are those sort of problems they don't have business models they have you know we can help avert costs but those are future costs which will be borne by other people not our own cost now and so we i can't remember it was before we were recording i think but talking about externalities because we've not worked out how to financialize externalities Effectively, uh, we aren't. We don't have incentive mechanisms to get people involved in solving those types of problems, and that that's a that's a massive problem for our a society and also for our economy, mm. um, because we're 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 sort of building this massive bubble, this massive debt. All those big problems: the the uh, plastics in our ocean, mm-hmm. the the uh, the antibiotic resistance climate change all of those things yeah. are arguably because of these externalities yeah and civilization is is just building up this this debt which will one day come back and bite us and do you think philosophically it comes down to sort of collectivist versus individualistic type of uh type of societies do we do we need to be become a little bit more i don't know community orientated I think yes, um, and that, but there's also quite a wide gap between the you know the sort of egalitarian communism and you know sort of 
Right, I wasn't saying, I wasn't necessarily... No, I I do appreciate you use the word collectivism Mm -hmm. rather than than communism, but Mm -hmm. just to point out the scale, you know, through to rabid individualism on the other. (laughs) (laughs) But I think there's there's something that we've lost and is is this, the commons. Yes. And so that which no one owns and everybody Mm -hmm. owns, that which is everyone's problem and no one's problem. Mm -hmm. And, And, you know, by which I mean like fresh air or public health or fresh water and the things that that keep us alive the the shade of that tree mm. you know it's a lovely a lovely thing but it's not anyone's real problem yeah. to yeah. fix or do and though i think also there because it's been so neglected for such a long time it used to be kind of taken care of by religion and also by more um liquid societies i they, they didn't really move very much like now we're quite atomized we're quite gaseous as a society mm. you know people stay in one place for eight months and then they move and they mm. get another flat and they move to city and you know um and you didn't have that and so people may have paid more attention and invested more in their local community and but i think and and there was the church that took care of of protecting individuals and creating holy days that you know, obviously mm. then become holidays and then you got the emergence of unions and I think unions played a really interesting role back in the early day before they sort of became self-interested and narcissistic and, and, <laughs> and selfish and annoying, as many of them are now. Not say so they don't do good, good stuff, but fundamentally, not a good track record, guys. But they, how they started was fantastic because it was here is, here is a problem that we as a community, we as individuals within this community are experiencing. Business has no incentive to fix it. Government has no incentive to fix it. Yeah. And therefore, we're kind of on our own. What do we do? And so they started mutual funds and mutual aid societies. And then they started saying, well, hang on, we've got this. this if we all don't go to work tomorrow we can actually have an effect Mm -hmm. and it's that where it's that how civic society we were talking earlier about uh, how do we pause it fix it for everybody Mm -hmm. and then allow it to move on i think that that space around the commons sort of like a modern union Mm -hmm. is is a really effective way of of dealing with that and applying collective pressure Mm -hmm. there's an interesting aspect of that as well which is that depending on the progress of AI and automation and robotics and whatnot, we only have a limited window through which to do that. Mm. Because everyone that goes on strike now, that people say, well, bring in the machines, and, you know, or automate it. And that's getting, and you know, mm. to a certain extent, that's a brilliant answer. But that's only a great answer if you're on strike because you want more pay. Whereas mm. if you're on strike because, hey, this world isn't working for anybody, mm. not even the machines. Uh, yeah, you've got a much better point, but you've only got ten win- ten years until mm. you know. Essentially, humans are becoming increasingly replaceable, and withholding labour ceases to be a useful lever. But that that I, I fully expect to see a lot of innovation in the common space, in the mutual space, and because yeah, you know, for example, if you look at what our pensions are invested in, I think we sort of think that capitalism and corporates are a different thing. Mm. We own those. That's our pension funds. Mm. Every investment that you've got goes into that. Mm. So it's our choice. It's our money that is shaping the future of capitalism. And we can choose. Unfortunately, again, made really hard to choose. But we can exercise discretion about which pension funds we join. We can choose to Mm. join a high-impact pension. We can choose to divest and pull all of our money out of fossil fuels. We can choose to to invest in the businesses that that share our values. If you look at most pension funds, like you you would be mortified to find out what most people who are auto-enrolled, they're in the default pension. If you look at what it's invested in, if hell, if you can even find out what what it's invested in, you're doing well. But then you review it, and it's like, what? That's not cool. I did Mm. not want to be invested in weapons and oil and massive Mm. banks. I want to be invested in, you know, world-saving biotech and renewable engineering. I want to be um, renewable energy. I want to be invested in the stuff that's going to do a hockey stick curve in the next ten years because that's what we need. And we're not doing that. And so I think mm. that collective collective responsibility, so you're right, collectivism, and that idea of, oh, 
oh, it's ours. We can do. Oh, we can do that. And that that reintegration, I, as you know, as the pendulum swings back from the atomization, I think. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic about that space mm-hmm. as a realm for innovation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting. The other thought I had is through all of this sort of voting data, it as you use the words open source, mm-hmm. I think that's great because you know, data is the new oil, as people have been talking about. And uh, actually, Google and Facebook, and they've got this these massive deposits of, of data that we don't own, mm-hmm. that we've, we've voluntarily given away, uh, that, as we know, uh, have, have been used for various nefarious mm. purposes. And if we find a way to get control of that again, our, you know, our, and I think our we need political to... opinions, then that's that's power. So you're 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 skirting back towards the new business model for represent um, that essentially if we do this as individuals, you know, I should be paid for my data. Well, you know, okay, here's mm. four pounds. Enjoy paying for the internet for the rest of the year, and I, you know, and we'll give you maybe five pounds next year. Mm. It's not worth it. It's not worth it, no. no. But if we do it collectively... It's huge. Like, that's the entire business model of the internet. Mm. So if we do that collectively, there's shitloads of money there. Mm. We can really empower there, and we can really do things if we can just organize to do it ourselves. And, you know, it has to be an enlightened way, not in a kind of, hey, everybody get together and share. Like, it's going to be mercenary businesses Mm -hmm. but they're going to be beneficial corporations they're going to be cooperatives they're things that are owned by and run for the interest of their members and and that is in their charter you know the idea that you know there's a new um a fair bnb starting up that is owned and run by the members um similarly you know countries that don't have uber or Mm -hmm. any ride sharing yet there are open source taxi sharing systems Mm -hmm. car sharing systems out there you know if you're in slovenia right now Download one, start one up, mm. and and run a Commons one and and nail it before Uber gets in. Because mm. as soon as they get in, they're going to have a lot more money to mm. spend on marketing and a lot more brand awareness. But if you can start up, you know, Slovenia cab, mm. right, done. Mm. And so there's yeah this this space of recognizing that essentially we humans need to you know as decoupled as as large numbers of people who aren't in that one percent and or in that 0.1 percent and aren't Mm. wedded to the idea of corporate efficiency and economic efficiency being the sole Mm. arbiter of good uh, and who want to create these multipliers in our society and who want healthier distributed jobs and and more sense of fairness and opportunities yeah, that that collectivism, cooperativism, mutualism, that that in the commons, that space is um, hopefully, fingers crossed, going to flourish. I mean, it's been increasing a lot. It's also late. more libertarian as well. There's more. It, there's more competition, but fair competition. Yeah. These, yeah. You know the the Fang, Facebook, Apple, uh, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Just again, the amount of the amount of data that's concentrated in those. Those yeah. small, those four businesses, those yeah. huge businesses. Yes, yeah. I mean, and I suppose with that come there's a part of me that wants to talk in defence of them, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, just that a lot of those who have great power also are exercising a lot of great responsibility with that power. Sure, but the compromises that they make in order to keep some of those things rolling are perhaps not where we would go. And I think that greater participation within, um, essentially greater participation within decisions tends to lead to better outcomes because you've got more people affected by the impacts of those decisions who have a voice and stand up and help you correct for those problems before they become problems. And so you end up with a better system. And it's I think you can rely on people we're much better at agreeing what we're against rather than what we're for and much better at organising around what we're against rather than what we're for which is I think fantastic Mm. because it keeps us out of doing the really stupid dangerous selfish stuff Mm. and doesn't dictate 
how the future should be and how you should live and it doesn't get sort of um you know it doesn't get commandy but it does stop us being really stupid and annoying and and that and essentially destroying ourselves mm. often um so that's that's nice mm. um we can often be a little bit unpragmatic and you know we need to be have our hand held as we make public decisions like i was saying if you were going to institute a a um a collective parliament that it shouldn't have any executive power for at least 10 years like, you know let's let's be pragmatic and mm. let's phase it as we withdraw from these fossil fuels or otherwise we will collapse everybody's pensions and screw over every pensioner in the world but let's definitely do it and let's accelerate it and let, but let's do it sensibly and intelligently and wisely and mm. you know so yeah allowing people to choose non-directions of travel mm. is is i think a we're, we're, fa we're just so often failing to harness that and mm. and then that's it's very powerful mm. um it there was uh, i don't know if you've read skin in the game by T Taleb. i don't know if we're going to need to i've, no, it's fine. Wrap I've, up I've not read it yet mm -hmm. um but uh but understand the concept the thing, yeah i know this thing also mm. about the power of the minority actually i think uh, i've read the blinkist on it right <laughs> yeah. right uh and he talks about so for example kosher foods mm -hmm. and so in a in in there's so many things that are actually kosher because mm -hmm. food stuffs because you know if you're if you if you eat kosher foods and it has to be that way but if you don't then you 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 could still accept that yeah so it so through certain things through by having these sort of uh, i think it's called via negativa is what he calls it by by having these things that we won't do but that are acceptable to many people mm. uh, then the the these uh, the sort of power of this via negativa works the mm -hmm. sort of power of the minor, minor so if we don't you know i don't know invest in weapons or dangerous plastics or and we can make choices that don't hurt people yeah if you avoid those things then slowly that becomes the that that, that becomes the default yes we we um we experimented quite a lot on represent with that negative kind of decision making mm -hmm. what what do you find unacceptable mm -hmm. and and working it from that way rather than what do you want what is the desirable thing here which is your favorite it's where's your red line mm. what won't you accept mm. and that's a much more powerful way of um a surfacing consensus quickly and getting everybody you know through because if you do it that way you unite every, you, the chances of uniting everybody are a lot greater mm. and the chances are that the minority who doesn't agree with you on that one it's you know essentially going to feel enough pressure to mm. to you know like i know you're invested in fossil fuels and i know you want your investment but actually we shouldn't be doing that or mm. you know hey ceo you're the only person who's getting 120x the average wage in this mm. company so i'm afraid you're gonna have to rein that in a little bit mm. uh and so the yeah it's a very it's a very effective way of, of making decisions mm. i think it's fascinating i think what mm. you're doing is absolutely fascinating and we we desperately need it as a society mm. we've been going for for a while so i think we're going to need to wrap it up soon but was there anything yeah. that we didn't get a chance to cover that you wanted to mention no i think we've covered off a lot of things i'm sure there are all sorts of i'm sure i could have made this considerably more useful in thinking of sort of lessons no, no, i've learned on my journey and, no, no, and this is all this is uh, all great this and is, helped you dear listener uh, uh, yeah, this is, this is great. get more out of this but uh, i've certainly enjoyed the conversation yeah no uh, I, I think i think everyone who's listening will will, uh, will enjoy it will have enjoyed it before we go where can people find you where can they find represent uh, anything so else you wanted to mention uh, my name is ed dowding and i'm ed dowding on pretty much everything, everything. Uh, and uh, represent is at represent.me uh, and I think that's that's so my, should, should my sort uh, of people be following represent.me for for changes in yeah why not pivot and yeah so like represent this. me is the domain name and yeah. at represent live is yeah. the uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook um, uh, but definitely you know by all means follow perhaps be a little bit patient uh, for a while uh, having to pay bills is time consuming and doesn't allow a lot of time for for development but i'm hoping that this year we'll see quite a lot of big changes and also um you know essentially the political climate is it's done its chaos period and i think we're sort of 
<laughs> I was going to say, I think we're over chaos now. <laughs> no, we're not. But uh, we're getting out of, we're getting more solution focused. Mm -hmm. And there's more innovation, more viable innovation creeping up and a greater appetite for that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm expecting, I'm expecting an exciting year. So, yes, but please do, please do follow us. Perhaps, perhaps follow me at Ed Dowding on, on Twitter or whatever. Um, and you'll, and, whatever way it goes you'll you'll find out there that's uh, that's great that's that's wonderful just i would also say yeah follow all things risk as well yeah of course you do of not course. have enough followers <laughs> I, this I is need, great I need, content I need, and I need it needs more. to see yeah, the world yeah yeah i need more but um also to, to listeners i would say if uh, if you have any ideas for 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 you to you know to for ed just go and uh and, and, and let you know because I'm sure there there are several. Yes, yeah, I'm I'm always up for um, meeting people either with interesting ideas themselves who want who want help, uh, or especially if you're interested in the in the uh, civic tech space and one way or another want to make the world a better place. Yeah, by means get in touch. Especially if you've, you're a venture capitalist, or in fact a venture communist. Let's give it that one. <laughs> <laughs> venture commonsist. Um, commons if you've got yeah. lots of money and you would like to give it to us or if you've got lots of talent and you would like to bring it to bear on this problem um, by all means yeah please do get in touch uh, uh, that's fabulous and just as an aside on the the whole I, I do think we're kind of coming through the other end of certain aspects of the chaos and I think I, I was told uh, was give, it was, there was this opinion that I think is valid. I like to think is true is that fake news is going to become a little bit more like spam and that mm -hmm. we'll be able to spot it a little bit more and just like spam was a problem in you know, the internet, the early days of the internet 20 years ago, it's less of a problem. Ooh, I don't know. I hope so. I hope so. I think there's a slightly generational thing that, you know, younger people are better at spotting fake news and we share it less. Um, and, the, but fake news is also weaponizing. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got deep fakes, you've got lots of, the internet is a massive ecosystem and there are lots of niches to fill and in those niches yeah. thrive all sorts of mm. interesting and novel inventions which will often be uh, cancerous for want of a slightly mm. better word um, or at least have the potential to do harm and uh, yeah definitely fact check stuff but uh, mm. I sort of wonder about fake news, how much of a problem it actually is. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, like fake news in the American election. Did that get Trump elected? Mm. Or was Hillary just a shit candidate? <laughs> I, ultimately, if you're not going to put up, like, if it comes down to yeah. fake news and if yeah. it's that close on the election, you probably didn't try hard enough in, yeah. elect, in getting the right person yeah. to the public Fair arena enough. in the first place, Fair right? Enough. So fake news to a certain extent is a um a sort of darwinian force that uh, that requires of us to up our game mm. and requires of us to build better things that people know are working mm. that you know this is a massive fun exciting project that everyone can get enthused by and this is you know this is happening and we're all part of it and that that sense of um a society making meaningful progress if we can work on that stuff i think think the noise of fake news goes away that much more because it it becomes much less significant because we're not trying to fight each other we've all got a common purpose or you know reasonably shared purpose that we can work towards that is worth working towards whereas if it's a massive bipartisan fight between you know, a and b or country a and b then yeah. fake news helps that war but if everybody opts out of that war and goes and builds some cool stuff instead then the war just yeah, whatever play the game if you want but we're over here saving the world and like and yeah so i could of course be wrong <laughs> <laughs> well I, I think i think it gives us uh, a good positive note to uh to uh end on yes so ed thank you very much for your time it's this was brilliant i enjoyed it a lot being a pleasure thank you very much all right we'll we'll talk soon Yes, Thanks and again. follow all things risk. Absolutely. All right, thank you. I hope you found that thought-provoking. Check out Ed. Links are in the show notes as usual. And of course, 
Let us know what you thought about anything you heard today. Leave a comment on social media or just drop me a note, allthingsrisk at gmail.com. Of course, don't forget to subscribe to the show, allthingsrisk.co.uk. That's .co.uk. We will be back in two weeks. Until then, and as always, don't forget, risk is life.